Welcome to Ireland Unfiltered. Before we get to this week's guest, Michael Healy Ray, we've got Patrick Hoy, producer of Ireland Unfiltered, with us to tell us about this week's competition and some breaking news. Also known as the warm up act for Michael Healy Ray. So mm. I'm very privileged to be on the seat this week. What a fantastic guest. But breaking news, yes, yeah, so regular listeners to Ireland Unfiltered and regular viewers to Ireland Unfiltered will know that we've been running a great competition for the last few weeks, thanks to Carlsberg Unfiltered, our sponsor. Carlsberg Unfiltered being a new cloudy pilsner, like Ireland Unfiltered, it's a new lager that's stripped back, less processed, with no filter for a more natural taste. So thanks to Carlsberg Unfiltered, we've been giving away a pair of tickets to all 10 gigs at the Live, Live at the Ivy Gardens series of gigs this summer, and we have a winner. So Fantastic. Congratulations, Kevin Fortune. Point. That's why you're here. That's why I'm, oh yes. Yeah. Well, no, I have more news after this. Okay. So my, the first bit of news is Kevin Fortune. Congratulations. You have a pair of tickets to all 10 gigs live at the Ivy Gardens this summer. Okay, but we now have a new prize. Oh, yeah. This is a, an, another fantastic prize. It's to um, live at the Mar Marquee Cork, all right. of the gigs. So same again, a pair of tickets to live at the Marquee Cork this summer. Um, wait, you hear some of the acts. Tommy okay. Tiernan, Christy Moore, David Gray, Versatile. Versatile, you may or may not know, they're a new hip-hop duo who are, um, they are storming, storming the country. That gig is already sold out, so this is a pair of tickets to a sold-out gig. Okay, and great. And many more than will be too. So, for full details about how to enter this competition, stay tuned to this episode, and we'll give you all details at the end. Thanks, Patrick. And now, Michael Healy Ray. Michael, welcome to Ireland Unfiltered. Thank you very much, Dianne, for having me I appreciate it. It's great to have you here. Um, tell me first, what would you say is your greatest strength as a politician? Oh God, I don't know. I wouldn't be going praising myself like that at all, I suppose. First of all, it's a privilege and an honour to be elected to anything, whether it's to a county council, to an urban council, to the Dáil. Any time that you put your name out there and that people trust you, and say, right, I will give this person a vote, be it a number one or a number two or a number three. The first time I got elected to anything, people that gave me a number nine, it mattered because it was on the ninth count I got elected. Mm. So I really value and appreciate when people trust you with their vote. And then you have to earn it. And like when new people are starting, like I have a son now that's canvassing for the first time for himself. And what he's saying to people is he's saying, look, take a chance in me this time and just trust me and then judge me the next time, do you know? And like everybody has to start somewhere mm. and to build up a reputation as a, a politician or as in anything, if you were a plumber or an mm. electrician, you, it's your reputation is what you're building on, mm. do you know? So I, 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 I suppose I'm interested in people. I like people. And yeah. I, I'm worried about other people's business, if you know what I mean by that. Mm. If you're a hairdresser or if you're a farmer or if you're a small shopkeeper or a Republican or whatever you're doing, mm. if I can do something in my work to help enhance your well-being, mm. whether it is your health or your finances or the road going to your house, I'm interested in people. Mm. And I believe that's what politics is about. Now, there's people up here in Dublin would ridicule that sort mm. of politics but to be honest, to hell with them. Like, I mm. don't care what the people think like that. To me, like to be elected as a national politician, you have to be elected locally. Mm. So it's very important that local people trust you and that want you to be there. Otherwise, you will not be there. But you say to hell with them in Dublin. Sometimes do you think it plays into your hands in Kerry? No, I don't mean to say it that way, to hell with them in Dublin. What I mean is to hell with people that try and ridicule that type of politics. But, but does that ridicule... Uh, strengthen your constituency and str strengthen you when well, you're in Kerry? Well, I don't know. I mean, look Do at you it play this up way. to it? In that we sense. have a Taoiseach that thought it was a good idea to come out and say that he was going to reduce his carbon footprint by reducing the amount of meat he was going to mm. eat. Like, he forgot he's the Taoiseach for the whole of the country. Mm. He's not a Taoiseach for Dublin. And there are, we are predominantly a farming nation, mm. you know? And uh, he was turning his backside to all the farmers in Ireland by saying that because if you were struggling to make a living out of a small farm yeah. and to hear the Taoiseach of your country come out and saying oh like you know meat is bad by, by the reference yeah. he made to it that's not good that's not being a balanced Taoiseach and I reminded him about it an awful lot inside the doll. I won't let him forget it because it was a stupid thing to say 
And that's fair enough because you know everyone understands how important, or people should understand how important agriculture, agriculture is, is to this yes. country. But you know we're sitting here on a on a February evening where it's been incredibly it's incredibly warm day. Like you know, do you feel like as a politician that maybe that you can use the constituency you have and the and and the power you have and the privilege you have to kind of say to people, maybe say to farmers like. Look, something needs to be done. We might need to change how we farm, how we do things, because something is happening to the climate. But can I ask one yeah. thing now? Right now, this minute, mm. there are 9,600 aeroplanes up in the sky. Yeah. Is somebody going to come along so and tell those people, well, you know, in the future, we're going to have to stop all air travel? Because look at what they're putting out into that. They have atmosphere. tried. To, they've done things with that. They've done carbon taxes. They do things with that. So They do things with it, my eyeball. <laughs> like, there is but nearly 10,000 planes up in the sky, and we have people coming along and talking about farmers with their animals and that that's what's you know, going to destroy the earth. So Rubbish. It's, that's exaggerated. And then somebody burning a, a, a bit of a turf in a fire or, or cutting a bit of timber to keep themselves warm. Like they want to perish the people. They want to starve us that we won't be able to eat meat. We won't be able to drink milk. We won't be able to light a fire. Like, I mean, that's nonsense. Well, like, it's probably, it, isn't, it isn't nonsense, but we don't want to get into a kind of what is a, like, you know, a, a factual debate about climate change when it's accepted that it's happening but, but I didn't say I didn't say anything about nothing not happening yeah but, but what I'm talking about is an overreaction and going penalizing people in rural areas for for what is perceived to be a problem because at the end of the day if they're talking about carbon taxes who's going to be the worst off who's going to be affected the most the person where I was for instance last night down in mm. Ivy in Valencia Island all that side of the country yeah. they have to travel a lot further to get anything if it is to go to a hospital go to a doctor but Kerry also rela- Kerry relies on tourism too and if like if places are being flooded and if places if the coastline is, is being altered uh, because of climate change there's going to be damage there too it's not Armageddon like that I mean the, you know, the seas haven't come in up on top well, of us and going to Caris overnight like they well look that's you're entitled to your opinion <laughs> well it's probably the f- it's closer to the facts yeah. but i'm not saying i don't want to get into this is not a show where we get into a to and fro and you say i just wonder when like people i've talked to you about about you this week they talked about how gifted you are how brilliant you are uh how you play up to the image that that the dublin people certain people in dublin give to you that and it plays well down in Kerry but what I'm interested in is kind of thinking what can you do with that in some in a situation like this where maybe there needs to be I take your point and I get that what you're saying about Vradker and saying this and maybe he's saying it for a, a headline too maybe he, maybe maybe he's playing up to people above around Dublin in his that constituency about, yeah. and that he's just forgetting the fact that he's a Taoiseach for the whole of the country but like the today like today inside in the Dáil today he started on about Dublin transport and you know, I actually reminded him in the middle of it all I said you do know there's more to Ireland than Dublin mm. there is life beyond the Red Cow roundabout but he forgets that he need to pinch himself every morning and say, look in the mirror and say, I am the Taoiseach for the whole of the country. There is more to Ireland than Dublin. And like, I like the people in Dublin. Don't get me <laughs> wrong. There's plenty of Kerry there's, people in Dublin yes, too. Yes, there's very nice people here in Dublin. But like, the world doesn't stop here like. And you see, the one thing that people who are coming out and saying, oh, we must reduce our meat. We must stop cutting turf. We must stop burning timber. They're missing one very important point. This is going to change anyway. The children are the grandchildren of the people like me mm. who would adore having a fire in a house and who, do you not know, we drive diesel cars. But remember, we were told to drive diesel cars. Yeah. But the, the new generations of people, they're not going to want a fire in their house. They're not going to want to go to the bog. I want to go to the bog. Mm. I want to cut tim- timber to keep warm because that was the way I was brought up. But the, the new people in the future, the people who might be watching this, they're not going to be like th- that. So by, by natural phasing out, it's going to change anyway. The likes of me is going to die and go out of the way mm. and we won't be there anymore. And people with my, what we might call old-fashioned ideas, will be gone and mm. we won't be a nuisance around the place. Like a lot of these things is a, is a Dublin versus 
uh, you know, rural no, Ireland You're mentioning divide. the Dublin thing an awful lot. Well, no, you brought I, it up I, to begin with. No, no, but I, no, no. Well, I said in answer to you, yeah. really. But like, <coughs> I, I, like I say, I think there's room for all of us. Like yeah. the country is is big enough but, that we can all live together. But it's just some politicians would want to remember that we need to always remember that that, that, that it's bigger than just but, the city. But I'm not saying it as a. I I I. I think, you know, the case you make when you talk about rural isolation and things like that, they're really important well, they issues important. That, that, that that you raise. Um, but do they then get muddied when you bring in things like drink driving, when you bring in like the, the, the new laws on, cl- you know, on clamping or seizing vehicles? Mm-hmm. Like well, I, but that was an awful thing to do because there was a system there before. The politicians who voted, for instance, to criminalise young people, I'm sure... Perhaps a lot of young people might listen to this program. Well, I'd like to remind those young people that uh, before it was accepted and it was acceptable for them to drive on their own with a provisional license mm. because, for instance, they were having to wait extraordinary lengths of time if the government were so bloody well worried about young people having a full license. Mm. Why didn't they bring in more uh, 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 opportunities for them that you could go online book your uh, test and have a test within mm. 10 days. If the government was really serious about dealing with this usu- issue, that's what they would have done. Mm. But instead, they went after the young people and their parents to criminalise them for driving a car while unaccompanied and not having a full licence mm. holder with them. I disagreed with that. I voted against it. I And the Clancy Amendment, I'm sorry. I don't ever want to see anybody die on the road, but I'm totally and absolutely opposed to the Clancy Amendment. I do not, ag- I do not agree with it. I've spoken to Mr Clancy myself, a very nice gentlemen I'm mm. so sorry for what happened to him and to other families but I, I just don't agree with that and Do you not uh, think it makes the road safer no absolutely not and I'll tell you why young people they, they, they have to be given a chance accidents will happen anyway Young people are responsible and to be painting young people with this brush that, oh, well, you know, that, like as if they're all half mad and half cracked. And when they get in behind the steering wheel, they'll put the shoe down to the last. And if they don't have somebody with them, like that, they're going to be irresponsible. I don't give in to that. I think young people are actually the opposite. Like, OK, like everything in life, mm. there'll be a, a, a bad apple here and there mm. or somebody that's not responsible. But why have a test at all then? Ah, but sure, you have to have a test. Why? If you if if they're if they're able to drive without it, why would you have but a sure, test? That's a nonsensical statement because we have to have standards. But, but you're just saying they don't matter. N- and I d- do you know you're worse than some of the politicians. <laughs> now I never said that. And if you want to play this back, play it back. Okay. You will find you're wrong. And okay. what you're wrong okay. I mean saying that because I didn't say okay. that. What I'm saying is that young people, if they could do the test right away, they mm. would. Yeah. But they can't. Now many of the politicians. And I want to remind young people of this, yeah. who voted to criminalise them and their parents. Eight vehicles a day are being seized now, which mm. is accruing 8,000 euros a day is being collected from these people. And I want to remind young people that the politicians who voted for this, many of them have told me up to my face, oh, well, sure, we did it ourselves, all right. So, mm. in other words, it was OK for those politicians to drive cars unaccompanied when they were youngsters. Yeah. But then they went into the doll and voted to criminalise other people who were doing what they did themselves. I don't agree with that. When you say that uh, you're interested in people, does it ever become a chore for you? Like, does it ever, when the phone rings, like you switched your phone off, before you, I you didn't, put it's buzzing away. It's buzzing away. Yeah, and are, yeah, yeah. are you worrying yeah. about that? You're wondering who that is now when it's well, buzzing away. Well, I just away. hope that it's nothing urgent, yeah. but I'll get back to him as quick as I can. But has it ever become a chore? No, because I, 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 if I, if it was a chore, you couldn't do what I do anyway. And I'm not saying that my politics is different to anybody mm. else, but you couldn't let on to like this. Like, you either yeah. like it or you don't. Yeah. And I never in my life, like, I, you would never hear me complaining if I have to leave where I live and go, drive to Village Island, mm. right? Like, I would never start to think to myself, oh, my God, I must drive. Or if I'm leaving there at one o'clock at night and if it's going to take an hour and a half to go home and if my eyes are closing, like, I don't be cursing and saying, oh, Jesus, this is a fright. Mm. Like, it's a case, oh, yeah, I'm down here for the night to meet the people and, you know... And and then what's awful important to me, and I really cherish this, and it's it's what makes it all worthwhile, is that every place that I'd be, that there are people who have been with me, 
mm-hmm. and who were with my father perhaps before and like and then the younger people new people that came along mm. who will say help me because remember you couldn't do this on your own mm. either so in each area you would have people who help you for instance last night like we could hardly fit inside in the car the crowd was yeah. that were there and we were going around meetings to different things and uh, I actually said it at one stage. We were leaving. I was after doing a clinic, and like the clinics now, there would have been a lot of them all yesterday mm. evening. But leaving one place, there was such a crowd, it was going out the door. I actually looked behind me, and it was like half the bar was coming out with me. Mm. And I said, you know, we're like dead's army. And like, it's just, it's nice to have people like that yeah. behind you because you're no good on your own. Mm. You know, it wouldn't work if you were on your own. You couldn't do it if you were on your own. You need a team and you need a team in each place and you need people who are your eyes and who are your ears and who are your advisors. Yeah. Do you know, uh, like some of the people up here, they have to pay for their advisors. My advisors are my friends mm-hmm. and who have been with me always and who are terrible sound men and women and younger people mm. that, you know, they're just interested in politics. They're interested in the way I do politics and they they like to keep that going and they believe in it because they see it for what it is and it's just trying to help people and help in areas, mm. you know, and there's great satisfaction out of that. Somebody told me you spent a half an hour on the phone the night before the election, the last election, trying to persuade someone to vote for you. Oh yeah, that would be nothing strange. How many votes? How many first preference votes did you get? I the got, next day, I was very thankful for the 20, votes I got. Twenty thousand. Yeah, but like you can't take anything for granted, and like each one of those was very much needed in that you could mm. be shot to vote. Yeah, do you know? But someone and they said you you knew you pretty much were certain the night before that you were. You're never certain. No. You're never certain. So you'd spent half an hour the night before talking to somebody. I would. I'd yeah. go on my knees for it. Would you? I would. Because you could be shot that one. Yeah. Do you know? And like the one thing that nobody should ever say is, oh, well, my vote doesn't count. Yeah. Because that could be the vote that could make all the difference. Mm. The amount of people that have lost elections by one vote, or should I put it another way, that have won elections <laughs> by one <laughs> vote, do you know? Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't like to, to, to name a person, but when I started, um, myself and my father were on the, the old Southern Hill Board. Yeah. And there was a general election and there was a very nice man. He would have been from uh, a bordering county, we'll say. And uh, very nice man. But when the votes were counted, he was up and down. There was recounts and recounts. Mm. And one day, it went on for a week. Uh, one day he was winning by one or two. The next day he was losing by one or two. But, you know, it knocked hell out of him. And he eventually won by, I think it was something like one or two right. votes. And I met him afterwards and, you know, he was after losing, I'd say, about two stone and he didn't have a whole pile to lose in the <laughs> right. first instance. And the poor man, he looked like he was after being dragged backwards through a field of briars. like. Yeah. And uh, I said to him, well, how are you feeling after that? He said, I'd never again want to go through it. He said, <laughs> yeah. you know, he had got such a fright. Yeah. You know? So like a vote is an awful imp- and like people often say, what is my vote? Vort? A vote is actually priceless. Yeah. Because you couldn't put a value on it or you couldn't put a quantity as to what it would actually mean mm. because it means so much. Um, did you always know you were going to be a politician? No, absolutely not. If you told me when I was uh, growing up, if you told me that I don't you know that a lot of days I'd have to put on a suit in me, mm. I'd be laughing at you forever. Like when I was 12 years of age, I couldn't write my name. Yeah. So like, how could I think I was going to be a politician? Because... Being a politician, it is sort of important that you can read and that you can write. You said that in your book that yes. you were came, you were just short of your teenage years yes. when you started to read. Yes. What happened? Like how? How was I that was developed? profoundly dyslexic. Yeah. You know, and um, I'm after discovering an awful lot about being dyslexic over the years. Mm. You know, but like that time we knew nothing about it. Like all I knew is that when I, I was in school, the best way to describe it and being not being too politically correct about it, I would have been classified as being slow. Mm. You know, because I was inside in a classroom with great people, friends of mine that were what I'd call really smart people. Mm. You know, like I, you know, there was a man Kevin O'Reilly. He he's an accountant now, and like when we were going to school, I would have looked up to him like that he was a genius yeah. because he could do everything. Do you know, there was other fellas that were great with sums and everything. But when you can't read, when you can't write, it is a big, uh, yeah. it's a big haulback. But what I did, I made up for it in other ways. Like I, I, I use my head in other ways. 
mm. I suppose it's like if this hand was weak, this hand would be very strong. Yeah. Strong. Well, I couldn't read and I couldn't write, but I could do other things. Mm. I could the, use my head in different ways. The uh, old Liverpool football manager Bill Shankly used to say, "Me having had no education, I had to use my brains." Well, th- that is a good way to put it, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. And and like, um, it was just I was lucky that uh, I met uh, a nun, Sister Regina. She's still alive, and uh, she taught me how to read and write. Mm. And you know, it was a great help. Um, she was a young nun at the time, and she was very good looking. <laughs> and uh, that was a great encouragement <laughs> at the yes. time. Yeah, she was yeah, the lovely nun. And uh, she she was very gifted at helping people. The very first day she met me, she said, um, she assured me that I did have a brain, but that it needed a bit of working on. And she said it was locked up with little padlocks. Yeah. And she said, the problem is there's no key for these locks. But she said, I'll make a key, she said. And it'll take us time and eventually we'll open every lock. And she said, you'll be amazed at what we'll find. And one of the first things I did get to really like, and I, when I say like it now, I adored it, was reading. Yeah. And like everything I could catch, put my hands on, I'd read it. And like I'd be at night, I had a flashlight uh, in, 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 the, in the bedroom and mm. I'd be going under the blankets reading Eden Blyton. Would you ever read yeah, Eden Blyton did, books? Yeah. Yeah. And um, I used to love them about yeah. the famous five and the dog called, what was his name? Dog, oh, um, God. was it? Oh, jo- was it? Uh, yeah, I can nearly remember the song. There was a yeah, song as well. There was, Billy, yeah. no. No, but anyway, it was Timmy the dog. Timmy, Timmy, Timmy the, the dog. faking dog. Timmy that was him, dog. yeah. But uh, no, it, it was great. And like, it was, uh, could you imagine like being 13 and 14 and for the first time ever, you know, being able to look. And then, oh, there was another book then, Tell Me, Tell Me Why. Yeah. And then tell tell me more why and all this. Right, yeah, it yeah. was it was very good. But that must have been a, like a, a, a revelation to you suddenly to have this oh, as the, the thing but unlocked. John, as it would she take said. the bar at home. Yeah. Like my father's name was up over the bar, Jackie Healy. Yeah. And like for years, I used to be looking up at this and wondering like what exactly does that say? Do right. You know. Yeah. And uh, could never. You know. I like okay. On one hand, I knew it was my father's name, but at the same time, it was just all mumbo jumbo. Uh, and uh, and you see, dyslexia, then it it depends on what where you are, mm. you know. You can be mild, you can be medium, or you mm. could be very severe. And like very severe means, what it actually means in letters is that, we'll say you could be looking at something. And rather than, it would be very easy if it was just flipped over backwards, like yeah. a mirror, that'd be, or that'd be no other life. But if it's if it's that the letters are jumping out and going in di- to different places, mm. like, it's like, it's like a code trying to decode it like and yeah, trying yeah. to master that and it takes concentration and like even to this day if I get excited and if I'm writing I can start writing backwards right you know yeah and 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 I can get confused and what did she see that other teachers didn't see you see it was nothing against my other teachers mm. my other teachers were brilliant people mm. but it was just I mean you were one of a very big class and mm. and like you know those teachers there was no such thing as special needs assistance or yeah. anything like that so like they literally and it wasn't their fault you were literally left behind because if we couldn't keep up we were left behind and mm-hmm. that was it but I suppose she just had a way about her and she was very smart and I mm-hmm. maybe that she'd been doing it you know although she was young she couldn't have been doing it for that long but I suppose she was gifted Yeah, you know it's like some it's one of those people that you know everyone hopefully gets in their life that comes yes. along at the right time. Well, if she hadn't come along <coughs> when she came for me, I definitely wouldn't be here sitting down with you, mm. you know, talking about politics because mm. it, it would be that I had to be a politician and not be able to read and write. And do you think the way you seized upon it then and read so voraciously was because you felt that you were almost making up? Ah, sure, I was making up. Sure, I was like an out of control train, like because <laughs> I had to get all this into my head. Yeah. And like I was, and like those books, I'm not joking. Those, those, um, tell me more books and all that. They were brilliant yeah. because like everything you would read, like just you know if it was about trains or about aeroplanes mm. or about the earth and about what the earth made up of and mm. what's what but, but you know why do the stars shine why why is why is the sun shining why is there daylight why is there darkness mm. simple things the things that you know everybody else would take for granted all of a sudden i was able to find out well this is why do you yeah. know and all along all i could do was hearing and talking yeah. but all of a sudden i was able to read it like do you know it was probably 
if, if we twisted this around, it was probably be actually to my advantage because I became obsessed with learning then mm. in a different sort of a way. Yeah. You know, so to you this day, if my house will ever go on fire, it'll burn for three months because there's so many books inside it. Right. Yeah. And you, but you were, like, you were probably an entrepreneur before you were a politician, where you were do, like selling, you know, sweets well, in the in the playground. I, 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 I wouldn't think much now of the entrepreneur or anything like that. But let's put it this way: I was never afraid of working, and no. I always liked working. Yeah. You know, and I still like working. You yeah. know, and I believe that everybody should work. You know. And the harder the better, you know. If it is easy, it does no good. And if yeah. it's e if it's easy, and you like, were you like, was your father? Your father worked hard. Oh God, yeah. And my grandmother, like, they were all, you know. Work would be very important, yeah. you know. And like my father, uh, you would often hear people saying, "Well, I started with nothing." Like m my father's people, like they would have started with less than mm -hmm. nothing. You know, yeah, yeah. my grandmother cut turf as we we're talking about turf mm -hmm. barefoot in the bog. She mm -hmm. had two hands in her that were bigger than any man's hands, like yeah. you know. And she was strong, and she was a, f a fine woman, like you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and I mean that the people were like that long ago, you know. Yeah. And they didn't have a washing machine. She had a, a pan outside the, the door of the house and a board, and mm -hmm. shorts would have to be in trousers would have to be rubbed on that to get them clean. And like everything was the hardware, but like it, you know. It is a bit like Brendan Grace and the story, you know, like we were murdered from work, but by God, we were happy. Do you know, do you know that's, mm. It's that sort of mentality, yeah. like that people did things the hard way. But uh, And when did politics and the idea that you become a, a politician take hold? Was it once you started reading? Because I know you start, you used to go when your father was director of elections, he might go around, around the country. The country yeah. Like when somebody died, it's an awful thing to say, but when when I'd hear a TD was dead, I'd be delighted <laughs> because um, it, it, it means you'd be off of school <laughs> for three weeks, fight here by election. And like yeah. it wasn't that they were dancing <coughs> or anything. Like mm. my father would have been working, putting up posters, doing yeah, donkey yeah. work, giving out leaflets, doing this, doing yeah. that. But um, it was going somewhere new. It was meeting new people. Mm. And w there was great people that were friends with my father, people like Dan McCarthy from Milltown, uh, Morris Galvin, Pat Gairn, Tim Coffey. There was g great people, Arthur Linehan. There was gr great yeah. people there that, um, very intelligent people. You yeah. know, My father always surrounded himself with people that were brainy. And to be honest with you, I like doing that. And I, I think, because uh, I wouldn't go classifying myself as smart or anything. Mm. So I think, I, I, uh, how would I put this? I think it's very comforting to know that you have smart people with yeah. you. So if I'm inside in the car, I like having as many people as you can fit into it. And every one of them, as far as I would concern, would be way smarter than me. So that's a great advantage. And was there an excitement in it too that you didn't get in school? Like, as you were Oh, sure, there was, of course, because if we won the election, it was great. Yeah. And and if we lost, like, we were gone. <laughs> I remember one night, I think we were in Donegal, and around two o'clock in the morning, we had to vacate a place because the election was lost. And my father said, that's it, we're out of here. And like we bailed out. And another thing you I remember. You bailed straight away, would you? We bailed out that night. But I remember <laughs> another time staying in a hotel. And uh, it, is, it is amazing the things you'll remember. And there was a sink inside in the bedroom. And I thought this was hilarious. Like right. to be inside in a room <coughs> where there was a sink mm -hmm. in a bedroom. Because like we didn't see sinks in yeah. bedrooms. Yeah. Yeah. Not don't mind talking yeah. about a bathroom yeah. in a bedroom. like. But this sink was over in the corner. I remember going and looking at it and I turned to my father and I said, what in the name of God have they got a sink in the bedroom? Like, what would want a sink in the bedroom? For? <laughs> but it was very funny. So we had, we had good times. Like, yeah. you know, we had good times. And was that it then? Did you start thinking of it then? As a, no, uh, no, not at all, not at all. Like we'll say when my father was running for the doll, um, I was his director of elections, which again, was um, it was uh, an honor, I suppose, when you look back on it now. But like it was, there was nothing glamorous about it at the time yeah. because it, it <coughs> was tough going, and you were part of a team, and you were trying to keep a team going and mm. keep a thing uh, rolling. But my father, you could learn from him every day of the week, you know, and you could learn from my mother too. My mother could speak seven languages; mm. she could speak and write Arabic. And um, it used to be very funny. She used to go away then, like, in, you know, for the last 27 or 8 years of her life, she used to go away for three months to the same hotel um, in Fungarola in um, 
uh, room 902 in, in the same hotel and uh, she had all these friends over there mm-hmm. and people that used come from Germany, Italy, mm-hmm. different parts of Spain, England and um, she'd give three months there but like when she'd be walking along she'd be talking to people in their own languages right. and she could change like that, you know. So she had a good head. And she was from uh, Delaware. Yeah, she was born in in Delaware. She was raised in um, in uh, New York, and um, she was a good woman. So like, it's like everything in life. It's nice to have nice parents that, uh, you know, that that you learned a lot from, and that. Yeah. Even though I used to always think it was very funny, I couldn't read or write, and my mother could speak <laughs> seven languages. Right. You know, I used to think the world was unfairly divided. Yeah. Like. And you were the were you the youngest. Oh the, God, yeah. And were the you youngest all the time? Yeah. 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 And were you her pet because you were the youngest? Well, I don't know. I suppose I never, I, I never looked in it that way. But I was the youngest anyway, mm. so that was that. But there was a big gap between you and and. Well, yeah, not that much. I suppose there are four or five years between uh, myself and Rosemary. It'd be the the next old mm. she'd be very old in comparison right. to me of course yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know she'd love that <laughs> right but uh, was it but it was uh, like was she when she when you had your dyslexia was like but was she like was she trying to find solutions for it too well it was she found sister Regina right. so because she got the solution to the problem mm. yes like I don't know however she managed to get her I don't know but. Um, and I still keep in very close contact with Sister Regina. Do you? I do. Because I, I must tell you a funny one about that. Um, the first time I got elected to the doll, we were heading back to Kilgarvan. And uh, I wouldn't know many Reginas. It's not mm-hmm. a very common mm-hmm. name. I know a Regina inside in Khmer, and I know a Sister Regina, and I think that's about it. Oh, yes, and I know another girl. So I have about three or four in my head. Mm. But the phone rang anyway, and the phone was ringing nonstop, but somebody handed me the phone, and they said, this is Regina, and whatever may be, take the phone. And I said, is this Sister Regina? And she said, it is. And uh, she said, I'm ringing to congratulate you. And I said, God, Sister Regina, I said, should I be completely unelectable only for you? Mm. And uh, she said to me, should I know that, Michael? But that's not important now. <laughs> just as much as like, yeah, you're right about that. But uh, so I just thought it was very nice. She knew how important she was yeah. in the whole equation. Like, And when you went, well, talk to me about when you did run for the first time. Like, what did you? Well, we'll say run for the council. Mm. When I ran for the council the first time, it was extremely difficult because the area I ran in, it was going to be terrible, terrible, tough to get elected there. Mm. Um, get elected to the council. This is why, like, I'd have so much respect for politicians. I don't care if they're Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, Independent, Sinn Féin, Labour, whatever they are. Like, people who run, and running for the council is a very, very tough operation. Mm. And the area that I ran in, it was known that it was going to be very hard. And it was known that if I was going to get elected, it, it would be very by a very small yeah. you know, amount or I could lose it by a small amount. And I think when I won, I won by 90 votes. So I learned an awful lot through that election mm. of how important it is to get a two or a three or a four, whatever you can get. Mm. Like, and I mean, unless somebody really hated you, that that give you some vote, mm. you know, if you ask them and mm. if you ask them nicely and if you just tell them, look, take a chance in me. And may, it's l- like a grading process. If 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 they give you a three or a four or a five this time, maybe you might go up a little bit in their estimation mm. the next time. Do not you'll be hoping so, mm. anyway. And just try and be genuine about your politics and let people see. And like, I, I think I heard a person say one time that you know in politics it's like you're either like marmite or they, do not they like or they mm. hate you. Some people. Yeah are divisive like that and I, I know that there are people who wouldn't be in love with me like mm. you know but I'm sorry about that but I am what I am and I don't try to make myself out to be anything that I'm not Did it ever bother you? Not really no Did it bother you about your father? Oh yeah I'd be very defensive of my father mm. you know like we'll say when I'd be at meetings and if I got some fellow we'll say uh, attacking my father like mm. I'd defend him alright don't know. S- somebody said to me the only time you'd walk away from a vote is if they somebody said something derogatory about your father. Yes, I wouldn't like that. Yeah. I'd 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 fight my case a bit, but if I thought they were very bad, I'd yeah. let him off. 
Do you know? And does that come from growing up hearing it? I know. I suppose it's just you know who wants to hear somebody saying something that's not nice about you know yeah. and like the one thing now that would be like a red flag to a bull altogether now is now that my father isn't here mm. and I've seen it happen from time to time. Yeah. I've seen it happen and you know maybe at, in certain venues it could happen in the doll where a person would make a derogatory comment about my father yeah. and like I will not let him get away with that yeah. because like you I have an attitude about dead people mm. if we're not going to say something good about him mm. don't say anything because mm. you should never wrong somebody that's not you know in the in this world yeah. to come back at you you know it's like tomorrow morning I'm after saying things uh, to, tonight to you about Leo Varadka mm. well if Leo Varadka wants to he can give me as good as what yeah. I'd give him tomorrow you know yeah. and he can have a go at me but like if he wasn't in the world well, it would be an awful thing to say anything about a person who's not able to come back and talk up for themselves. But you feel protective over them, your father too when he's not... Like, I, I, I get that if and, people say that and, about my father and who's yes, dead. Yes, and his memory. You know. and uh, Yes, and it's like we're on dead. Mm. And I told you at the start of this interview, he was a very respectable man, was your dad. Mm. And I remember him being editor. And, uh, and uh, I always classified him as being fair, respectable and balanced. Mm. And think of how important that is because when we're gone out of this world like I didn't even know it was going to be you mm. was going to be doing this and the minute I heard of who you are I thought oh god yeah, you know, I like this now because I liked your dad mm. so that's the memory that I have yeah. of your dad but you can't buy that you can't pay a person to have regard for a person do you know what yeah, I mean yeah. like so in other words that man earned that in mm. my head and it's like my father had a respectable name. He was a respectable politician. All he wanted to do was help people. And if I got somebody trying to knock that, well, I'd obviously defend the yeah. thing. And do know? people still knock us? Do you get people? Ah, sure, of course, would get people. Mm. And no, and you, 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 you mustn't get mixed up. It, it's like um, people can have a laugh and a bit of crack yeah. about things my father did. Mm. I mean, I'll give you an example. And like people often thought, oh, was it a joke or something? But it was a true story. In 97, uh, in the first election, mm. and uh, we only had mobile phones for the first time. Yeah. And I remember ringing um, my father uh, one day and wherever he was, he was going up to a house and the poor man, when he pulled the phone out, he put it up to his, and I, <laughs> when he heard me in the phone, and the first thing he said was, Jesus Christ, Mike, how did you know I was here? <laughs> Do you see? <laughs> and like the man was as genuine as the driven snow. <laughs> and like, so these sort of funny things that yeah. happened. And like my father used to come out with very funny things, you know? Mm. And like, if people, you know, to this day want to have a laugh about stuff mm. like that, there's an awful difference between laughing with somebody and laughing at some of the yeah. things that they did, yeah. you know, rather than, you know, being, you know, not nice about them, mm. you know. Are you an emotional man? No, I don't do emotions. What? I don't do any, you know, I, I know it was hard to talk. No, I'm not really, no. Like, you know, I, to make me upset, you'd have to hit my thumb with a hammer, that right. sort of a thing. Know. But when you you lost both your parents within nine yes. months, yes. Well, I will admit, I, I I it was like a sort of a tsunami of 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 problems. There was four people. They're still in my phone, and yeah. the four of them were on speed dial or whatever you call yeah. that. And um, there was my mother, my father. There was Bernard Collins and Arthur Linehan. Mm. Now the way I describe it is, Bernard was like the brains of the operation, and like. He was just like me. He was in my head. I was in his head. We used mm. to talk like every hour, you yeah. know. Arthur used to go everywhere in the car with me. Mm. Like he literally <coughs> hit thousands of kilometers every week mm. in the car with me. And uh, not having him in the car, like it was like go out without our trousers on, mm. you know. We used to go everywhere together. And, and then obviously my mother and father. And all of a sudden, in a very short length of time, mm. they were all gone. Yeah. And it was, and it was, oh, it was just horrendous. Like when Bernard was passing away, my mother was passing away at the same time and I'd leave her house and mm. I'd go to Bernard's house and it was horrendous. Mm. And like, but everybody goes through that. 
like I'm nothing special no. you know everybody goes through it but like four people in a short, short length of time and yes or it would affect your head yeah. and I'd, and like it would it would rattle you but like but you lost a lot of advice and wisdom oh are you joking I, I lost a mountain of advice and if we added together their their ability to assess problems and to tease things out and talk things out and they were all so nice you know mm. and like they were such great company you know mm. and like yes late at night and early in the morning and like they were very balanced because like some of them could ring real early in the morning like Arthur you could be <laughs> on the phone to Arthur like any time after half five and it would be yeah. fine like you know yeah. and um, and Bernard was the same and you know it was great having that type of a backup and support mm. you know but like uh, look that's what happens in life you know we're not and I'd be very conscious of that that like we're no one of us is going to be here for a long time you mm. know but do you but like were you lost for a while without, without especially with your parents in such a short yeah, space of time it, or like it would rattle you mm. it would rattle you to your bones yeah it would but but I my attitude would be you put down your head and you put up your backside and you drive on you know Mm. And and like regrets then like of course there's things I'd be very very regretful about like when my mother was very sick, um, I was uh, I was staying in her house with her, and uh, uh, th- I was canvassing at the time, mm. and uh, there was days like that I'd say you know maybe I should stay with you, and like one in particular day I remember she saying no, and she said you'll go she said, and. Um, go canvassing like mm. and I was going down the stairs and uh, she shouted after me and uh, what, what did she put it in you'll, you'll go you'll run and you'll win and don't lose do you see nice. and it was like it was like getting that message yeah. like whatever about the situation I mean you don't lose anyway yeah. do you know and so I suppose it's this sort of attitude of that you keep going do mm. you know and you you have to be tough yeah. And and there's no time for nonsense, and there's no time for fell-dealing about it. Like you just have to get on with it, and uh, and like you know, it, like look, there's other people they lose children and they have yeah. to get on, you know, and it's so difficult for them. And mm. and you know that's another thing. If you don't mind me mentioning it, because I'd like to knock the the myth of it on the head. If you don't mind. Um, and again, young people, if they're listening to this, they mightn't get it. But when it's explained to them this way, you often heard about politicians going to funerals, right? Mm. I go to a lot of funerals, mm. but I was never in my life, never at a funeral that I didn't know the people mm. that I was going to. And you see, again, smart Alex, they have this. And when I say smart Alex, I mean smart Alex in the media and in different sections of life. They start to look down on politicians that go to funerals. Mm. The only reason they do is because maybe they don't have many friends themselves and mm. they don't have to go to f- funerals. But like I'd know people and I'd be dealing with them. And if they were ill, I'd be dealing with maybe the problems that they were having through their illness. Yeah. And then it's all a common courtesy. You'd go to say goodbye to them mm. and to be there to, to talk to their families. But a lot of people don't get that and they think, oh, it's politicians running around to funerals mm. for the sake of it. You're going because you're meeting friends. You're you're paying your respects to yeah. a person that you might have adored, you know, yeah. and, and, and they're gone and you want to be there to, to, to pay your, your respects. And do you, do you feel like I, um, I know you say everybody goes through it, but I think I've noticed I've mo- both, both my parents are dead and I notice this thing that you just become aware of that until people go through it themselves they don't really oh, understand it and even if something like a funeral like you're saying there when you're when you're when you're burying someone you love there's people showing up and bringing it's giving their respects comfort. it's a big comfort oh, that it is. Uh, so know, maybe that's a dividing line like it's not that uh, if people are smart at it but they've, if they've gone through it they understand it they, maybe they, and more. it does mean an awful lot yeah. and like it just somebody going to the trouble of being there to shake your hand and like it was like both my parents funerals uh, the amount of people that came and it just showed that mm. they were important to an awful lot of people yeah. and that's very nice and it's very comforting and mm. and simple things like 
I, I remember when my mother was leaving Scrahan Muse for the last time and all the neighbours came out and sort of stood outside in the road just saying goodbye, mm. a very simple, ordinary gesture. Yeah. But, like, it means so much, yeah. you know? So, like, look, living is, is very important, but dying is a thing that we, we'll all have to do. Mm. And if we're going to do it, it's nice to do it r the right way and to do it in a respectful way, you know? And... Um, and like I say, some people, maybe they don't get that, but uh, they'll eventually get it and they'll eventually understand it. How long was your mother ill for? My mother was, she was ill, we'll say, what we'd call badly ill for maybe about four weeks, mm. you know. But like up until that, she was able to go out and things mm. in the car and like was able to take her out and things. And we, you know, we did carry her out for you know dinners and I remember carrying her up to Ahado to look out over mm. the lakes and things and she lived in Killarney yes yeah and uh, you know things like that uh, are important and again you would have regrets about not having more time you know yeah but you know in life if you keep looking behind you, you'll fall over something that's in front of you. Mm. So, like everybody in life, I've made mistakes. I've made plenty of them. And if I could go back, there's lots of things mm. I'd change, but we can't. Yeah. So, all you can do is just drive on and smile. There's a passage in your book about your house. And you say, my mother and father built it. And not once in my life have I le ever lived anywhere else. No. All the memories are still in the walls. Every inch of that house has memories attached. My brothers and sisters left. My mother and father left. But I never did and I never will. No, I'll go out of there with my toes out first. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, either it's just like I sort of, I don't know, it is unusual because, mm. uh, you know, people move or they grow up and they go out of the house yeah. they were in. But I never went anywhere, you know. But there must be a lot of powerful memories in that house. Oh, there is. There is. And it's a very ordinary house. Mm. My father uh, made the blocks for it himself. Mm. Um, we'll say at the time, an awful lot of houses would have been mass concrete walls, mm. but blocks were sort of becoming the new thing. So rather than buying the blocks, he bought the machine for making the blocks and he went to the river himself and he got the gravel mm. and he got the cement and he mixed it and he made the blocks. Mm. And uh, so it was a better house than a mass concrete house then because of that. You had a cavity in it, there were two lines of blocks. And... Um, it's like it's a very ordinary house, but I like it, and mm. that's it. And I won't be leaving. Mm. <laughs> and your parents separated when you were ten, did they? Yeah, about that age. Yeah, which of course was, I suppose, a bit unusual for the time because um, I don't want to say it's more common now, but I suppose mm. the truth is it probably is. But that time it would have been less um, uh, common, and especially maybe in small places. Yeah. But look, that was just. I suppose it showed they were ahead of their time in another way. Like, you could look at it that way. But we'll what, look it looking back, life. I know you say you don't look back, but looking back at it now, what would you say that did f for you as developmentally and how it f shaped you? Because even in that regard, that it wasn't common, like that must have been something to uh, take on board. It was, I suppose, yeah. But um, maybe it would toughen you up a bit. Yeah. Do you know? And maybe it might make you realise that um, you have to start to be a little bit independent yourself and you had to work yourself to be your own person mm. because when things like that happen you have to rely on yourself maybe a little bit yeah you know so uh, a bit of toughening up I'd say That's and so that was the thing because we had Barry Kogan the actor in, in our first show and he lost his mother at an early age and he was talking about that we were talking about this idea that if something big happens to you at a young age it does give you that sense of right I'm not I'm not kind of looked after the way I know you're not saying your parents didn't look after you but it makes you realise that nothing is permanent yes oh yeah and like sure and you're after saying a very smart thing in life yes. in general like the one thing that we're sure of, 100% mm. sure of, nothing ever stays the same. Mm. Whatever way things are today in your life or in this man's life or in my mm. life, like it's not going to be that way for always. Yeah. The people that are there now, they won't be there always. The condition you're in now, the physical and mental condition mm. you're in, you're not going to be that way always. Yeah. So that's why I'd be obsessed about one thing 
in life and that is you know not to waste time mm. because th- th- it's so finite you know and it's going to change and like we're all going to change and like there's no person I know getting better you know from the <laughs> point of view like <laughs> our bones are going to get a bit yeah. slower and creakier as time will go on and like that's why it's so important to not waste time and like if you were to ask me would I be obsessive about anything like if <sighs> the time in the day like you'll never again have today back yeah. do you know if we have an hour we'll say doing this interview we'll never again have that hour again mm. never ever mm. so it's very important to use the hour do you know mm. and I would be that way about life in general and I go to lots of schools and it's one thing I always tell young people um, that like youth is great but like you don't want to waste your youth and like when I say wasted I don't mean that they have to be killing themselves studying mm. or killing themselves uh, you know in any like using their time could be out playing ball yeah. if you yeah, like yeah. playing ball well play the yeah. shite out of the ball do you yeah. know what I mean yeah. and give a pile of time at it do you know and and if you if you like acting in the school play well do an awful lot of that if you like playing the accordion play it an awful mm. lot do you know if you like like whatever you like doing use a lot of your time to what you enjoy doing and if you like working if working is your thing well kill yourself working mm. do you know because whatever you're happy at do you know like it, and it's amazing the way People are so different. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And you got married in New York? Yes, myself and Eileen went to New York to, um, to, to a, ch- a church there, a small. And my mother and father actually got married in New York as well. Did they? they got married right. in St. Patrick's Cathedral. Okay. Yeah, we went to an old, smaller church than that, like, but. That's interesting because people, if people were to, to guess how many people were at your wedding, they would say 300, I'd say, or 500. When my nephew, my nephew got married and I think there was 900 sat right. down for the dinner and there was 1400 there at the end of the night <laughs> okay yeah. so I was really low balling it with 300 so but there many were at your wedding I'd say there was three or four people inside in the church yeah. and that included us and yeah. the priest why was that because we, we said we'd go to America because if you were to stay here you should have a big wedding and you'd be afraid you'd leave somebody out you know mm. we would know a lot of people you wouldn't want to insult anybody. Mm. So it was easier and quicker and faster just to go away, mm. get married and done with that, you know. And you said your wife was as close to your mother as you were. Oh, yeah, they would have been very good friends. And you know the way you would hear of, um, you know, what is it about daughter-in-laws and mm. mother-in-laws yeah. and all that sort of thing and maybe they're not getting on and things, but they were the exact opposite, mm. you know. They were really good friends, which is nice, I think. And did you have any tensions in your, like, as your parents had separated? Did you have any anger towards either of them or did you ever find no, it difficult? No, 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 no. 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 I wouldn't, do, I wouldn't be that sort of way at all. No. Anybody that didn't know me, I just, I get on with everybody and I smile away and I find it's a way better philosophy. Yeah. Do you know, it's a way easier to walk along the road with a smile in your face than a frown in her face because if we're smiling you'll ca- confuse an awful lot of people because they'll always be thinking what is he thinking of now mm. you know so it's but it must make you know it's, I'm not saying you you have to kind of you know navel gaze or anything but do you, do you wonder like if it affected you if it uh, like how it changed you with your parents separating I uh, I, I suppose like I would have never been fixated with it, if mm. you know what I mean. Only the one thing I'll admit to you, all right, I don't tell lies. It was unusual from the point of view of that, we'll say, even inside the school in Kinmayer, I I wouldn't have honestly known anybody else in any yeah. of the two schools in Kinmayer that would have been in that situation that, that I knew of. Do you know? Mm. And do was you know? that, were you picked on because of it? Or? Uh, uh, no, 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 no. no. No, no, no. But people make comments because kids do things, say things. Like no, I was sort of fortunate enough that way. I yeah. remember, all right, there was a couple of smart Alex, um, and it wouldn't have been about that issue, uh, but there might have been sort of smart boys, but all we need to do is bait one of them and that would stop the rest right. with him. <laughs> do you know? What do you think Leo Radker's strengths are as a politician? But, you see, 
this is where we have to be fair, right? Mm. He's the Taoiseach. He's 40. Now, he might have some other age of 64 or something, according <laughs> to weighing skills. <laughs> but, like, uh, he's 40. Technically speaking, he's 40, going on 65 or 6. Yeah. But I told him uh, not too long after he became Taoiseach. Uh, and I, I, it's not telling something out of school because it, it wasn't that private a thing, but we were alone together and I told him, it doesn't get any better than this for you, mm. right? He has his legs underneath the Taoiseach's table. It doesn't get any better in Irish politics than that. Mm. And in other words, my message was not to be like Theresa May thinking, oh, well, do you know, if I had an election now tomorrow morning, maybe I could get my feet further underneath the table, yeah. do you know? Like, you have to be sensible about power when you have it. Mm. And... Uh, do you know the way you get people that would be knocking him like if you want me to be clinically fair about it he's 40 he's the Taoiseach and he managed that mm -hmm. so you have to say well he was able to do something yeah. I'm not saying I agree with him I'm definitely not saying that he was very smart when he came out with the statement about eating less meat mm. but like but he, he must have something between the two years mm. at the same time but what do you disagree with? Like disagree with him apart from you know statements like that that he makes. Like what would you say your political ideology is? Well, you see, it all depends on if you look at where people are coming from mm. and what they want to achieve. You know, mm. like I'd be very definite in in my views and in my like I don't do this business. You know, of wetting the finger mm. and seeing which way the wind is blowing. Mm and marching that way then to keep with the crowd. Like there has been a couple of very big fundamental issues that you could say I didn't take the populist side of the road because I, I'd be very fundamental about certain aspects of life, do you know? Like what now? Well, for instance, uh, like abortion. Mm. And um, and like there are things like that that it it would be... And I, I would feel that politicians like Leo went a certain way, maybe not necessarily that they believed in it, but they were doing this, measuring the way the wind was blowing, but that's their entitlement. Were you surprised you know? when, you say you didn't go the way the wind was blowing, but were you surprised when the vote went the way it went in, the, in your constituency? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll give you the answer to that. And it, there are people who canvass with me yeah. and who are with me every day of the week and they would have a different viewpoint we'll say for instance on that subject than mm. I would have mm. but they respect my opinion mm. and I very much respect their opinion it's like if you were to tell me for instance that you were completely different on that I I mm. issue to me well my attitude to you would be well that that's a democracy mm. you know and I wouldn't be one of these politicians that would be trying to tell you oh you were wrong and I'm mm. right mm. like I wouldn't dare do that mm. my attitude is well, this is the way I am do you know yeah. this is me and if you like me for that, fine. And if you don't, I'm sorry. I'm not going yeah. to change, you know. And if I thought it was going to do me damage politically, well, I wouldn't change, you know, mm. just for that. Like, you, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for everything. Were you surprised at the result in your consistency? No, because I suppose I saw... There it was, was 58%? Yeah, there was, percent, there was an awful lot of young people that were registering to vote and going out and making sure they had a vote themselves mm. and they were doing so because they were going voting in a certain way mm. and like again that's their right that's their entitlement and um, I wouldn't ever want to stop people of doing what they want to do mm. and uh, but that doesn't mean to say that I have to agree with it yeah. you know but but look that's life and um, we debated it in the best way possible and I I and I, I thought I did what I could do and people had a different opinion and, and that's it. But like there was an awful lot of people in Kerry, to be honest, who were against abortion too, mm. do you know? Um, you mentioned there about getting power uh, with regards to Leo. Like, would you, like, were you offered a minister, minister for rural would affairs and would you be interested in that in the future? Because... Well, I'll put it through this way. It's a very, very foolish politician that would ever say, oh, I wouldn't do this or I wouldn't do that. But people, again, who want to get at me, what they say is, oh, that I was offered a senior ministry 
and that I said no and that I wouldn't take it. That's not true. Yeah. And like I've told this before and I'll tell it to you <coughs> for once and for all, mm -hmm. I'll tell you exactly what happened. Uh, when other politicians after the election, many of them went home and they sort of sat it out and did nothing. Mm. I gave 74 days in Dublin and every day I was in government buildings inside talking, debating and what I, I was trying to do was make sure, sure that issues that were important not just to County Kerry, mm. but but to uh, the country, mm. were put into a programme for government. Because I wanted there to be a programme for government that would be something sensible, mm. something fair, something for people who were sick, for people who were living on low incomes, people living in rural areas, that there'd be a better shake of the, of the dice for them than there was in the past. Mm. And one of those days, uh, Indy Kinney called me, we were walking along the corridor and he said, come in here with me a minute. And uh, there was a young woman, she was doing her work inside in government buildings in her office and in a very polite way, the Taoiseach told her to, to vacate the room. So mm -hmm. off she went and we sat down and I said, what's up? And he said, well, everybody's telling me that there should be a minister for rural affairs. And I said, yes, I said, I've been telling you that for a long time, mm -hmm. I said, but a good few years. And he said, well, I agree. Mm. But he said, everywhere I go, he said, they're telling me that it should be you. And I said, well, I said, that's that's fine. I said, grand. And then he said, and I agree with them. He said, it should yeah. be you. And the answer I gave him was, look, I said, you haven't even done a deal yet with Fianna Fáil. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, he so he was sort of saying, well, look, this should be here and it should be you should have it. But at the same time, he hadn't spoken to Fianna Fáil, so he couldn't offer anything. Yeah. And I said, look, Taoiseach, I said, there's an awful lot of work to be done here, I said, in putting together a proper program for government. Mm. I said, after you talk to Fianna Fáil, I said, can't we see what will happen, right? And because he couldn't offer me anything. And he said, mm. yes, he said, we'll talk again, right? Mm. And that was the way it was left. Yeah. And when he did talk to Fianna Fáil, and when he was in a position to make people, you know, ministers and farm his government mm. and farm his cabinet, he was ringing people left, right and centre, but he never rang me, right? right. Now, that was his prerogative. Yeah. But other people then who were trying to, or oh, make me look bad opposite the public in mm. Kerry, what they said was, oh, Mike was offered a job and he wouldn't take it. Mm. Like, that was a lie. It was a lie. I've always told the truth. And if Indy Kindy ever feels like coming out and telling the truth about what happened, he will tell what I'm after telling you now, because that's what happened. And it was know? said to me that your brother was against you taking it. Well, I'll put it to this way. I, my brother uh, would have been firm uh, of the view that he wouldn't have voted for Indy Kinney mm. um, to be Taoiseach. And I'm always very mindful of when we're talking about somebody else, you would always be afraid you don't want to wrong or misinterpret what mm. a person, but he would have always said that, that he would not have voted for, for Indy to be Taoiseach. Mm. So uh, maybe that the Taoiseach was conscious of that in the back of his head mm. and that he might have made up his mind that if he had offered uh, me a ministry that he couldn't have been sure of two votes, right. you know? So, look, that that's life. But the only thing I don't like about that whole story is the way some people like to twist it, yeah. do you know? And, like, you were asking it in an honest way. You just want the truth. You want mm. the facts, which you're entitled to and which your listeners, of course, are entitled to. But I've seen other people going on radios and saying it as if it's a fact. Or oh, Michael Healy Ray was offered to be a minister mm. in the government and he said no. And like they say that because they think they, it puts forward the idea yeah, that you, yeah, you that want I, to that stay I on the sidelines. From it. Exactly. Yeah. And that's not true yeah. because, like, it would be a very foolish politician that if you are offered a position to better represent, mm. uh, you know, the people that you, you, you're elected for, sure, of course, you would be neglectful in your duty mm. if you wouldn't do it. Do so you, know? you would do it if it was offered to you in the future? Oh, of course, you would have to mm. seriously consider anything like that because if it would be a help, not to you, but to the people that you represent. Mm. Because at the end of the day, and I'm I'm always saying this, in politics, if you ask me to describe what is a politician, mm. what is a good politician mm. in my book, it the way I describe the job description is you're a servant of the people. Mm. You are there, the people are here, and you're here, 
and their job is to use you to their advantage mm. and you're there to represent them. And any time that anybody thinks that there's anything else other than that, mm. they're raving, they're stupid, and they won't be there for long because that's what politics is to me. It's about, it's like... If you go into a restaurant and you get the dinner, somebody serves you the dinner. Mm -hmm. Well, if you were in politics, you were there to serve the people. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And you wouldn't think that sometimes you have to lead the people or you're, you're not just serving them, that you might have to represent them in but a way because you, you know you, more about but you issues see, than but you some see, people you, would. You're doing that in serving them. Mm -hmm. You're representing them. And it's an honor to represent them. Mm -hmm. And and I really look at it every, every day like a privilege and and like if you were on a, t a TV show or if you were like on, on, in an interview like this and you're explaining, you know, on behalf of people, what are the issues, what is important, what is required, mm. uh, you know, you could be talking about the nurses and the situation, you could be talking about the waiting lists in hospitals and the solutions that are there for that and, and you'd be all the time listening to what's happening and trying to come up with solutions to the mm. problems, do you know? And and that's what it's all about. Did that situation with your uh, your your brother's view on that, did that affect your did that cause any tension? Because like one of the things people will always say about any constituency is that some of the greatest tensions in a constituency come from po two politicians from the same party, uh, you know, going for a seat in the same constituency. So does that does that ha happen with you too? No, because we have a, a system and an understanding, yeah. you know. And like it's like everything in life, you have to know the, the way you're doing your job, mm. you know. It's like <clears throat> how would I put it? It's like a person going into a field and knowing how to plow the field and mm. not how to. If you don't know how to plow it, you're going to make a mess of yeah. it, you know. So when you know what you're doing and when you have your system, and uh, the, you know, we'd be, how would we say, happy-go-lucky about things and we'd right. just get on with it and it is like us against the rest of the world. Is it, yeah? Yes. And was it always like, because he's what, he's 13 years older than you, is he? Is that it? I yeah. never counted him. You never counted Like them. I told you, they're just all very old. <laughs> all very old. But that's a long, that's a big, big gap. Like, were you cl were you close growing up? Well, I suppose, yeah, that was a big bit of a gap, all right. Yeah, I never looked at it that way. But um, and it was a good few of you in between. Yeah, well, like my brother Danny would always like f forget about politics for a minute. No, he would have always been an extremely hard worker. Yeah. You know, and like, and when I say work, I mean you know driving diggers and farming and mm. you know I I I always remember he bought um, a brand new tractor when like a brand new tractor was a very unusual thing. Mm. You know, you wouldn't see new tractors. Right. And uh, he he went to work every day with that tractor for years, you know, trying mm. to pay for it and uh, and to make a go of it, mm. you know. So tis things like that, I, and he still has it. Yeah. <laughs> and and <laughs> it must be, it must be, oh God, he did it up recently. It must be over 40 years old. Mm. It, it would be over 40 years old. So like there's sort of nice things I li mm. like to remember, mm. you know. And, um, and I... I, I I I very much value work, mm. you know, and uh, if a person is a worker, the it mm. it it'll carry you a long way in life. So that wasn't an answer to what I asked you though, which was whether you were you were you close. Yeah, well, I suppose you know, <laughs> close in the way of like would be be hanging around together. Mm. Like people have an impression. You say it's us against the world, yeah. and that's the impression that people have and like I was talking to somebody today in Dublin who I said I was interviewing you and, and he said something about what, what that your brother had said and I said no that's his brother and he said no sure they're both the same oh well like, uh, uh, like well, so uh, that's the imp impression but is the reality different like that you're not in each other's pockets oh no not? we wouldn't be in each other's pockets like in that like would we agree all the time mm. on we'll say b or viewpoints on politics not mm. always and like even my late father when I was in the council with my father uh, a vote could have come up mm. now and then you know and he'd vote one way and I'd vote the other yeah. way because we'd just have a difference of opinion mm. on an issue yeah. but on the big fundamentals mm. on the, the what we call the bread and butter issues mm. we would be the same 
do you know but like there would be other things that that I might say that he mightn't agree with yeah. and that he might say that I wouldn't agree with so I'd never profess that we're do not joined at the heap or anything yeah. like that absolutely not do you and know would there be more tension like you said you had a system in the last election will it be tighter in the next election I know you don't think it's going to be for a couple of years but well like, I wouldn't say a couple of years the, yeah, I don't think year. there'll be an election until next year right. but look every election that ever was uh, it always brings its own complications mm. God I remember d- directing the elections for my father and like there wasn't an election but there was some issue and there was some problem do you yeah. know so yeah. whatever will come our way we'll manage it mm. do you know and please what, God we'll manage it with uh, what I mean by that is we'll we'll have a, a campaign strategy like yeah. you know and what are your ambitions like you say you would take a ministry would you have ambitions to do you're doing a lot of television at the moment would you like to do something more formal in television like be a, become a presenter or do more presenting oh god no I you're very be good person. on television though. I wouldn't be a person for television but you're always <laughs> on television yeah yeah oh god no I wouldn't no 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 I'd be um no, I just I like I like what I do now. Yeah. I I I like uh, being elected by people to yeah. represent them. Yeah. You know, but my father uh, went into the Dáil very late. He was sixty-seven when he got elected yeah. to to the Dáil for the first time. So when other people were thinking about retiring, my father was coming to Dublin, mm. and he did an awful lot of good work. And uh, he 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 achieved an awful lot in those years, mm. you know, which was a great testament to him yeah. and to his work ethic, yeah. you know. And you have that work ethic. Like well, how many hours sleep do you get a night? Not a lot, not a lot. Like it's funny now when you, before we started this interview, I thought you seemed tired, and the minute it started, I couldn't see any trace of tiredness at all. Like. To be honest, I think before I started, I, I fell asleep for a minute. And sometimes, I, there are, and this is very funny, I can fall asleep for a couple of minutes. And when I'd open my eyes, I wouldn't know, was it after being two minutes or was it after being 20 minutes? Right. Or it could have been half an hour. Yeah. But so I actually, I was worried when I opened my eyes because I was thinking, <laughs> you thought you'd oh, slept oh, through the sugar, interview. how long am I after <laughs> my eyes, George? But, but um, no, I can do that. And and I I and I'd feel great after it actually. Yeah. It is like resting your eyes. It's not even being asleep, but it's sort of closing. And that's all you need. That gives you a yes. boost. Yes. But so you get you can get by on that through a day. Yes, uh, I can. Today, you know, I was tired today at times, mm. and um, it's like, do you know? It, 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 do you know? Again, it's about do you know the way people could ridicule you? Like you could be inside in the doll and. You, if you close your eyes like that for a minute and you, you wouldn't be asleep mm. but you could be just like I'm not joking you could be rest your eyes yeah. you know because sometimes it's hard to keep our eyes open like yeah. and if our eyes want to close one of the hardest things in the world is to keep them open mm. when they want to close yeah. like it's way easier just sleeping close for a while you know yeah. a very short length of time but last night now I would have got very little sleep and um, today there was times I was trying to keep my eyes open, like it was like uh, do not I losing battle. But you're worried that somebody will to be a picture. Oh of that yeah, and then, sure that's yeah. Uh, Jesus Christ, he's <laughs> there, he's sound asleep. Like, but that's not the case. Yeah, yeah. Believe me, it's not the case. But uh, but I I can do with little sleep. So. And like the hard work has paid off for you in the sense that you're you've made a success not just in politics but in in business. Like. God, I've made plenty of mistakes too. Did no? you? Oh God, I did. And like a lot of my friends, you know, we've we we made plenty of boo-boos in our mm. time, you know. But, but do you get defensive about it when you're asked about like the the your property or the money you've made? Like, is it like I'm wondering why you get defensive or why you should get defensive when you've worked so hard for for things? Oh yeah, but look, you sure would get you would get people trying to make out to be something that we're not. It is like they're not the the the, the doll register and all this. Mm. Like they'd be looking at that to see what we're after doing and what we're not after doing. Like I always say, sh- it should be compulsory nearly at this stage. If 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 you know if it has to be known of as what you're after doing, which you have nothing to hide anyway. Mm. But they should nearly go the whole way and they should have a register of what you owe as well. Right. right. And and then they'd get a sort of a balanced, more rounder 
<laughs> understanding right. of what it's all about. Because some people, let me put it this way, have a great ability at borrowing money. Yeah. And trying to balance things. And like sometimes that can work and sometimes it doesn't work yeah, out yeah. too well, as I know through right. over the years. But look, that's life. Because, but do you get to, do you, so does it, do, does, do you resent it when people bring that up? Because there was one report about it and it said, when you were questioned about your extensive property portfolio, Mr. Healy Ray resorted to foul language and personal insults. Now, I find that hard no, to no, believe from I, you. I actually remember that. Hmm. And I never want to wrong anybody, but like that's not a way I'd be, right. you know, because everybody knows I, I, I try not to use bad language hmm. to the best of my ability, except for the odd little F here or there. Yeah. Like, but like, I wouldn't be a person for that type of thing. And, um, but they wouldn't put it in if it hadn't happened. Oh, no, and, oh, and I'm not wrong in the yeah, person yeah. that said, but maybe that they just rubbed me up the wrong way. <laughs> right, it, okay. like, right, okay. Oh, I'm not trying to say yeah, they yeah. said something wrong or anything, because if they if they said I said something that weren't nice to them, mm. well, maybe maybe they weren't nice to me, yeah. you know? And maybe like the story earlier on, I was just defending myself. <laughs> <laughs> but does it, does it, does it, um, you don't con get concerned that it sort of, uh, it does you, damage for your credibility in the constituency where there are a lot of people who aren't making money well, who aren't let me put it to this way I I worked very hard I I bought a garage that was an old mm. garage when I was 20 and I used to open it in the morning you know very early and it I used to open it till 11 o'clock at night and I was selling tyres and repairing mm. punctures mm. And like you could pull in there at nine or ten o'clock at night and look for four tires, or you could have the back, you know, a wheel of a tractor punctured or a wheel of a lorry. And at the time, you know, the very fancy equipment that you have for changing tires and things like that. I had mm. nothing like that. Yeah. What we had was you had, a, you had a bar on the ground like that, and uh, for the car wheels, and we'd break it down. Mm. There was holes and a thing here, and we'd break it down, and we'd put it up here on a rim. And we'd put in a bar into it and pull it around like that. Mm -hmm. And then, do you know how you'd break down the wheel of a lorry? No. Pieces of angle iron. Right. And you'd have, you'd have the edges of them rubbed with a, a grinder yeah. to make them turned so they wouldn't yeah. cut the tyre. So you'd put them in. You'd leave the air out of it. Well, if it was flat, the air would be gone anyway. Right. And you'd beat it with a sledge to yeah. break it down. And, like, that was the type of work. And, yeah. and then, eventually, I changed that into a shop. Hmm. And like, it's just a small shop on the mm. side of the road, but I bought it when I was 20 and I borrowed every penny of it. Yeah. And um, and I think I had the money borrowed for 10 years. And at the time, interest rates went mad. Yeah. And uh, it was very hard, like, to, to pay it back. And it was no mm. joke, you know? Mm. But like, I I wouldn't let things like that bother me. Mm. But at the same time, it wasn't out of the sky, it felt, yeah. you know? And, and when I borrowed money, for the first time and for machines and everything like that, I never had uh, a guarantor or mm. anybody guaranteeing me. It was, I shook hands with bank managers and said, I'll pay this back. And like, come hell or high water, like I was going to pay it back, yeah. you know? And uh, that's the way I operated. And like, I only be a small operator, but mm. like, I kept it going. And then like everybody, during um, what we call the boom, I made monumental errors, like, do you know? Did you like what? Or doing the wrong thing right. at the wrong time mm. and for the wrong money and all okay. that. And, uh, but like, I just, uh, like other people, I just had to work out of it, do you know? Mm. And and I'm grateful and I'm thankful that I, I, I came out of it, do you know? Mm. And other people. And I suppose the problems, one thing I find about all that sort of stuff, when people come to me with problems and with issues, yeah. I don't think that anybody has ever come to me with a problem or an issue that I haven't had myself. Right. Do you know? Yeah. So there's no such thing as me saying to you, God, I don't understand that. Or how mm. did you do that? Mm. Do you know? Or how did you make that mistake? Yeah. Or why did you let yourself open to that? Yeah. Just in case of, oh God, yeah. You sure, understand I, everything. I understand yeah. this. Yeah. Do you know? And like if it's a farmer saying, do you know, I'm finding it very hard to manage because of, sure, I know mm. what the problems are before. You never say like, God, time. you eat Like you're not, not or, judgmental. Oh, no, I'm yeah. joking. Sure, yeah. I'm a bigger idiot than anybody yeah. because the mistakes that they're making, no, I might have made already. Yeah. Do you know? Yeah. So that's, 
and I think that's nice in a way because you're, you're well equipped at being able to help them because you've gone through it yourself yeah. you know and if somebody has a small business and if they're struggling with the tax man or with VAT or if they're you know up to their eyes and trying to come up with solutions mm. to, to their difficulties I may have to been there myself you know so and during the like boom then in the crash did you have like the equal side of that did you have like liabilities and concerns that oh were, god of course I did yeah uh, you and were trying worrying to about balance it. the yeah. book and trying to how would we say keep our nose clean yeah. in other words what you owe that you'd keep your debt paid mm. do you know and like the more you do the more difficult that is do you mm. know what I mean and uh, and like we are we all made mistakes but my father had a lovely saying about making mistakes and that is and I keep saying it to everybody the man or the woman that never made a mistake they never made anything do you know yeah. and like no one of us have a monopoly on being right mm. and we'll make boo-boos and like I've made political mistakes do you know mm. I remember one time I, um, I made an awful error uh, it was about zoning Right, mm. and um, I I helped. I voted a certain way in in the zoning, so I helped a person get a zoning that all the people in the locality didn't want. Mm. Do you know? Mm. And like the truth of the story was, I hadn't thought enough about it. I hadn't looked at it. I had looked at it in maps and things, but I hadn't gone out there mm. and I hadn't looked at it in the ground. And like it was an error, an absolute yeah. boo boo. Do you know? And uh, afterwards, there was people that were very angry about it. So what did I tell them to do? I said, the right thing for you to do is have a public meeting and invite the people who voted for this to the meeting. In other words, myself mm. included. Mm. And uh, so here I was telling them to organise and to mobilise and bring in the people that were responsible for this and have it out with them. <laughs> and mm. uh, sure, I was the first person into the meeting <laughs> right. myself. And as Luke would have it, they decided to put me up first to talk and explain myself. And of course, you see, there were maybe people thinking that I was going to try and come out with some very big, you know, plausible mm. explanation for why I had done what I did. But I stood up and I told them why I did what I did. And th th the answer was, I had made a mistake mm. and I had, I had done the wrong thing. I hadn't looked at it. I told him everything as it was. Mm. I said, I did this without thinking about it, without looking at it. And I'm so sorry. I'll never make the same mistake again. And we were able to go back in it. There was a second vote in right. the council and we were able to change it as it happened. Yeah. But like, I noticed at the same meeting an awful lot of politicians went up and they didn't admit they were wrong. Do you right. know? Yeah. Because some people don't like admitting they're wrong. But I have no problem in saying I'm wrong. And if I make a mistake, I'll tell it because it's a way easier to tell it. Mm -hmm. And it's a way easier to say, God, yes, I'm, I have no monopoly in it and being right. How could I? Mm -hmm. Do you know? And, and again, the law of averages is, and I'd always be worried about advice. You'd always be afraid that you'd give somebody the wrong advice. But the one thing that I find is the longer you're at this, the more used to be to are, the more... Um, how do you say the more experiences you have and then hopefully your advice is right mm. do you know mm. and um, but you you would always be conscious of that am I saying the right thing here now am I am I doing okay by this mm. person do you know but and if I'm ever unsure I'll tell the person God this is what I think yeah. do you know and I hope I'm right yeah. do you know and people appreciate it when we're honest like that mm. do you know and um, it makes a difference Oh, it does. Because, I, like I say, I know plenty of other politicians, they're so full of themselves and their own self-importance mm. that they think that, oh, they, they know that if they said black was white, that they'd be right. Mm. You know, I don't agree with that. Michael, we'll leave it there. That was fantastic. Thank you. Did we go on too long? No, I don't think so. All right, thanks very thanks much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Well, that was Michael Healy Ray. And this is Patrick Hoy, who has come back in to tell us about the uh, new competition. Far less interesting a person, but I've a very interesting so news. So yourself. 
<laughs> okay, so as we mentioned, we have a great uh, new competition for loyal listeners to Ireland Unfiltered, thanks to Carlsberg Unfiltered. So we have a pair of tickets to every gig at Live at the Marquee Cork, okay? And again, I mentioned we've got Tommy Tiernan, Christy Moore, David Gray, Versatile, and loads more. Okay, it's brilliant. So all you need to do with, to enter the competition is to log on to joe.ie forward slash Ireland Unfiltered. There you'll be asked for a couple of details and the answer to a very simple question, and then you're in the draw. Brilliant. Thanks, Patrick. And don't forget to subscribe to Ireland Unfiltered on all the usual channels. See you soon.